can basically colonize every kind of extreme environment we can think of. And that's hugely exciting for exploring um, life on other planets. We're, we're finding just incredible things that we never would have thought of before. So. You know, you could have just name your environment really and something will be living there. If there were similar civilizations to ours within, let's say, a few hundred light years, uh, I, I'm sure we would be able to detect them within the next century. The question of whether we are alone in the universe has puzzled mankind for hundreds of years. But having uncovered new scientific research, both on Earth and on other planets throughout the universe, are we now at a point that for the first time we may know not only where to look for alien life, but also what it may look like? There are many new discoveries being made every day about the origins of life on our planet. And through those discoveries, astrobiologists are able to deduce what life might be like elsewhere in the universe. But before we can understand about alien life, we just need to understand about life itself. I mean, there's no reason why an origin of life couldn't occur over a weekend or even a day. I mean, once something replicates, it replicates, and you, from that point on, you've got a Darwinian process of selection of molecules that can replicate, and ones that replicate faster will tend to dominate and then go on and, and, and replicate further. So, so the chemistry, once it happens, could have, could have um, uh, become established very quickly. But creating life doesn't naturally mean that it will automatically lead to intelligent life. Scientists believe that there is a mathematical equation that may explain the pathway that leads from early life to intelligent life. There are about four steps, four difficult steps, between no life and intelligent life. It's possible that the, the steps, for example, could be the origin of life, the origin of photosynthesis, the origin of these complex cells. You know, perhaps uh, the origin of animals or maybe the origin of intelligence itself. The only assumption you have to make in the mathematics is that the probability of each individual step is very small. And if you make that single assumption and work through the mass, you get this prediction that the steps should be roughly, not exactly, but roughly equally spaced through time, and that therefore life should, intelligent life should emerge four-fifths of the way through the available time. These four steps are the basis for our journey into uncovering what life elsewhere in the universe might look like. And there is no reason to believe that the origins of life on Earth would look any different to that on other planets. So what did early life on Earth look like? The first two billion years of life's existence was just single-celled life form, just microbial life. Once the Earth had sort of cooled um, to a sort of temperature that might have as far as we know, supported um, life of the type that we're familiar with, there's a maybe a half a billion years or so, 500 million years, and then, then it appears. So it's actually pretty, pretty quick. And so the likelihood is that if we find uh, life, certainly elsewhere in this solar system, but also thinking more widely, looking into um, planets around other solar systems or moons around those planets, the likelihood is it's probably going to be of a simple unicellular type. I think it is wrong to think of any life as simple. I think these microorganisms that are often dismissed as simple, I mean actually they're far from simple. All of this vast biochemical machinery that keeps us alive was invented by microorganisms and the real complexity in biology is within the microorganisms. All life on Earth today that we know came from a single origin. Now, there are interesting questions you could ask, which is, was there only one origin, or were there multiple origins of life, but only one eventually went on to dominate life on Earth? Uh, we don't know that. Some people have even speculated that there could have been multiple origins, and some of those other origins might still be on the planet today, hidden away in some 
hydrothermal vent or at the bottom of the ocean. But you know, if you go into a forest, you'll see slime mold, which is uh, microbes that, when they're hungry, they get together in a community and they march across the landscape in these sort of yellow tendrils, almost like a primitive animal. And yet, these microbes, when they've found their food, can break away and, and go off and do their own thing, but they behave a little bit like animals. They become, they become a single organism, um, walking through the landscape looking for food. One of the things that led to the development of modern, the modern science of astrobiology is the realisation that there are microorganisms on the Earth that live in places that we consider very extreme environments, and that are frankly more extreme uh, than 30 years ago most biologists would have thought completely uninhabitable. And yet now we found that microbial life th thrives in them. This discovery changed the way that astrobiologists looked at alien life. By searching for life that exists in extreme conditions on Earth, they began to understand what conditions life could develop on other planets. So one of the main places I do a lot of my research is in Iceland. Um, and Iceland's a really great country for doing research um, of this nature because it has a whole wide variety of uh, different geothermal environments or volcanic environments. Um, where we have these amazing kind of uh, geothermal vents, you know, which produce these, you know, these very dramatic geysers, and they're kind of shooting up material which is, you know, coming from much further down underground. So seawater percolates down through cracks in the crust, meets molten rock, gets heated up to about 800 degrees Celsius, doesn't turn to steam because the pressure is so high and then filters back round th through cracks into the bottom of the Earth's oceans and are vented back into the bottom of the oceans very high temperatures but while the hot temperature the hot, hot water is circulating through the rocky upper mantle then it dissolves a lot of materials from the rocks which enable it to um, provide nutrients for uh, things to live off. So that was interface between kind of hot and cold you know volcanism and ice you get a whole wide range of environments um, that life can actually inhabit because you get a gradient of temperatures, for example. You also get uh, different types of chemical species which can be precipitating out. Um, and those will actually preserve evidence of any active microbial life that's living there, um, which is really important. Microorganisms that survive at very high pressures. So we're finding these organisms at the bottom of the ocean floor that are, that are thriving in these environments where there's no sunlight, but we never would have expected there to be life persisting and actually just, just growing at a fantastic rate. But there are also microorganisms that will survive at very low temperatures, like minus 20 degrees Celsius. I mean, not just survive, but positively thrive and reproduce. There are microorganisms that survive in high radiation environments. Well, we're finding organisms at the centres of nuclear reactors, for example, where there are, there are ridiculously high radiation levels, but Organisms have adapted to survive these kind of radiation levels. The key thing from an astrobiology point of view is as we've learned that life can um, has adapted to this range of extreme environments of pressure, temperature, radiation and so on, we can find places on other planets which also have this, this range of environments. With all the new data gathered about Earth's extremophiles, science expanded its search for life out into other areas of our solar system. Mars is hugely important in our quest for searching for life elsewhere in the universe. It's the one place in the solar system that, although it's not like the Earth today, was like the Earth in the past. So if you go back in time three and a half thousand million years, you'll find that Earth and Mars were then quite similar planets. They had dominantly carbon dioxide atmospheres, they had liquid water on their surfaces with rivers and lakes. And we know that life appeared on the Earth in that environment. So the question is, did it also appear on Mars? Because if we go to Mars and find that life appeared on Mars when Mars was warm and wet, like it did on the Earth, and life has originated on two different planets with similar conditions, then probably life's going to be common everywhere in the universe that has carbon dioxide atmospheres and rocky, wet surfaces. With Mars, for example, we used to think for a long time, you know, that it was just a very barren, dry and dusty planet, you know, totally uninteresting no, never really kind of habitable to life, even in its history. Um, and the more we've explored Mars, the more we've come to realize 
you know, okay, we have a whole bunch of different types of minerals, which we know have to form in, in aqueous environments with the liquid water being present. Uh, we see all sorts of evidence for kind of like lakes, for example, or fluvial river systems. You know, we can actually get an idea that Mars was actually a very dynamic planet early, earlier on in its history. Now, something, for example, about the Earth that's strange is that its atmosphere has quite a lot of methane and quite a lot of oxygen. And those two just don't exist well together. They react very quickly and the methane should just disappear. The reason it doesn't is because it's constantly being replenished by life. About over 10 years ago, people on Earth took measurements of Mars and they said that they detected methane in the atmosphere of Mars. Now, you may think, okay, so what big deal? Uh, the point is it shouldn't be there on Mars. Our understanding of how methane behaves in the atmosphere is that it should be destroyed pretty quickly by sunlight. It, it sparked a debate in the community. So there was a lot of contention around whether or not their results were accurate enough because it was right at the limit of detection. On Earth, the majority of methane in our atmosphere is due to life. So it's, it's created by, uh, well, farting cows is the, is the most humorous one, but the majority of methane is created through anaerobic processes, through organisms which create methane as a, as a, as a byproduct of, of their metabolism. So for us here, it makes if you suddenly start seeing methane in the place it shouldn't be, it's kind of like, well, oh, well, is it due to life? We have a big role on the, on the orbiter, which is currently in orbit around Mars. So... Um, the, the aim of that mission is to look at, well, it's, it's in the, the name, the clue is in the title, it's the Trace Gas Orbiter mission. So it's looking at trace gases in the atmosphere of Mars. We find an atmosphere that's got oxygen, water, methane, and all the things we see in Earth's atmosphere. And Earth's atmosphere is massively altered by life. You know, if we saw that, I think it would be very hard to explain it any other way. The, the NASA Curiosity rover got to Mars and was capable of making these measurements. Now, they took some measurements they initially said there is no methane, which worried us a little bit because that was the purpose of our mission, was to measure these gases. They then came back and said, actually, we've reprocessed and we've remeasured and we are seeing methane. And not just the background of methane, not, not just a steady amount, but they saw in a timeline of measurements, they saw these specific peaks of methane. That's the really interesting thing, the fact that it's not a straight line, constant line, it's varying in its, in its abundance, it means that there's an active process happening potentially releasing this stuff into the atmosphere, which is really curious. It doesn't matter if it's biological or not, the fact that that is happening raises a million questions. It could be life, and that's obviously a, a way bigger kind of implication. Um, but we do know of microbes on Earth, methanogens, um, so they generate methane, um, that, that could be the source of this as well. And methanogens are, you know, in terms of microbes, they're kind of pretty amazing because they just need carbon dioxide and hydrogen to live off, basically. That's like their food. That they need and so if they have that which you know they do potentially have on mars you know they could actually be you know be surviving quite happily somewhere deep down in the crust but mars is not the only candidate for life in our solar system Europa is, a, is an icy moon around Jupiter and it has this very thick kind of icy shell essentially um, and potentially under that shell there's you know a liquid water ocean. Underneath this ocean there's a rocky mantle uh, which is probably quite hot because it'd be tidally heated by Jupiter which is why Jupiter's other moon Io is so volcanically active. So on a place like Europa you can well imagine an interaction between liquid water and hot rocks. We know from our own planet that life can exist deep in the ocean subsurface, it, deep at the ocean floor with absolutely zero sunlight, um, energy created through geothermal inputs etc. Um, and this is the kind of thing that we're expecting to be possible hopefully on these icy moons. The problem is that we are only just able to send probes to the deepest seas on our own planet and the oceans on Europa are covered in ice, which may be hundreds of kilometers thick. I mean, drilling into um, extraterrestrial environments is, you know, is an incredibly technologically challenging thing to do. You'd effectively have to melt or drill your way down through quite a thick crust of ice that we don't even know for sure how thick that crust is. But, um... but drilling through this ice may not be necessary. There may be another way. 
NASA's Cassini probe has captured these stunning images of Saturn's icy moons Enceladus. They clearly show fountains of liquid erupting from the surface into space. Somehow or another, the material within Enceladus is actually being sort of shot out into space in a, in a kind of plume that we can, we can actually image and take photographs of. There is evidence that Europa too is shooting plumes into space. And scientists hope that it will be possible to fly probes through these fountains to discover just what is going on in these mysterious oceans. So that's great because it gives us like a window into the subsurface. Um, so it would be great one day to have a mission that will actually fly out there and potentially even collect some of that plume material um, and bring it back to Earth to analyse here. Um, but in the meantime, we've already been getting lots of interesting data from those plumes. Um, you know, from Cassini, it's been measuring these plumes, you know, by flying through the plumes, you know. And the results are tantalising. We have, you know, simple organic molecules, for example, within those plumes, you know, simple salt uh, sort of phases in there as well, um, as well as liquid water. So that gives us an idea about what's perhaps going on, you know, underneath the icy crust on Enceladus. So we've already seen how life on Earth manages not just to cling on, but to thrive in places where only a few years ago nobody would have thought could have supported it. And we've seen how those very conditions are being discovered on Mars and on the moons of Saturn and Jupiter, where our probes can visit and investigate them. We've even seen tantalising possibilities that life, either current or extinct, could be found on planets close to our own. On Mars, explosions of methane provide unexpected clues, while on the icy moons of Enceladus and Europa, plumes of water shot high into space might even allow us to capture whatever is lurking below the thick shields of ice and return it to Earth. But what about other planets orbiting other stars? Are the conditions for life restricted to our little corner of space? Or is there evidence that on other planets orbiting other stars light years from Earth, conditions for life may be more common than we could ever have imagined? And what conclusions can we draw from our own planet about what life elsewhere might look like? Back in the 1950s, um, uh, people like Miller and Urey um, did experiments where they took what they believed to be the atmosphere of the Earth and they uh, added a bit of water vapour and they sparked energy through the mixture. And what they found was if they left this running um, for a few days or weeks, um, the reaction vessel became streaked with the building blocks of life, things like amino acids, um, nucleotides, uh, sugars and so forth, ATP. Um, but this is very, very different from life itself. So, If we take Professor Dave Waltham's mathematical approach as to how life comes to be, it may be that we are looking in places that haven't had enough time for life to develop, which means we need to look further away. Since the first discovery of a planet around another star in 1992, discoveries of exoplanets have been accelerating. Thousands are now... Thousands are now identified every year using tried and tested techniques. There are two main techniques. Um... The, the, the first technique that worked was that we detect the planet, uh, the, the star is wobbling. As, as a planet goes round a star, it actually makes the, the star wobble a bit, and we can detect that wobbling. But since then, uh, we've been looking for what are called transits, which is when a, a planet goes in front of the star, between us and the star, and, and makes the brightness of the star just dim very slightly for a few hours, and then goes back up again. Uh, and that technique has been very, very successful. we found thousands of planets that way. From the amount of dimming, you can say how large the planet is compared to the star. Obviously, the bigger the planet, the, the more the brightness of the star goes down. Uh, we can tell how far away from the planet it is. If we can also detect the wobbling, if we can do both of these techniques, if we can detect how much wobbling the star's doing, that tells us how massive the planet is. And if we know how big it is and how massive it is, we know its density. And from that, we can say, OK, with that density, it's probably made from rock, or no, that's probably a gas giant like Jupiter. And with those techniques, we have discovered a whole range of planets orbiting distant stars, and we can start to work out what environments are there for extraterrestrial life to inhabit. 
We now know that at least that planets are common. We didn't know that 20 years ago. Uh, it looks as if most stars have planets, and quite a lot of those planets are, are small rocky planets. So the next step is to find out what, what they're made of, what are their atmospheres, have they got water on them, and so on. And that too is now possible. By analysing the changing colour of the star as a planet passes in front of it, scientists can detect the molecules present in the planet's atmosphere. The technology is in its infancy, but with new instruments such as the James Webb Telescope, we could even detect the presence of life on distant stars. Uh, when our techniques get a little bit more refined and a bit more sensitive, so that we can look at smaller, cooler planets, then we can start to look for things that, that look strange. If we find an atmosphere that's got oxygen, water, methane, and all the things we see in Earth's atmosphere, a Earth's atmosphere is massively altered by life. You know, if we saw that, I think it would be very hard to explain it any other way. All the oxygen in our atmosphere is, is predominantly you know, produced by, by life. Um, and you know, it's unusual in the sense that oxygen is a very reactive chemical. You know, so you know, if you look at your, um, like a gate in your garden, for example, if it starts rusting, you know, that's the oxygen you know, reacting with the metal on that gate. You know, oxygen is really, really reactive. Um, so having it in such a large quantity on a planetary atmosphere, it shows you that there's something always producing that. Um, and, you know, there's not as many geological processes that could be producing that compared to what we know life can do. Um, so, yeah, that would be a, you know, sort of a bit of a dead giveaway that there's something going on there. The interesting ones are, um, are, are um, industrial chemicals that we're getting into our atmosphere. You know, the sorts of things that are causing the hole in the ozone layer, for example, because those are completely unnatural chemicals. So anybody detecting those from, from afar would instantly know not only that there's life here, but that it's industrial. You know, one of the strongest candidates for, for where life could have originated on Earth um, are geothermal systems or hydrothermal vents. Um, simply because, you know, have, you have a very rich kind of, um, kind of chemical inventory of ingredients, if you like. You know, it's a very energetic environment, so things are happening basically on a, on a sort of, you know, chemical level. And where you have all these things happening, it just makes it more likely that there'll be, there'll be something happening, something that's a bit more unique or a bit different, that will actually lead to, to the, the origin of life. Recognising where life may exist is one thing. Getting to it is something else completely. You can imagine spaceships that perhaps travel at 10% of the speed of light, which, which we certainly can't do yet. I mean, that in itself would be a very big engineering challenge. But 10% of the speed of light doesn't, doesn't challenge the laws of physics. That would take 40 years to get from the solar system to Alpha Centauri. I hope we're going to actually, within 30 years or so, actually have the technology to do that and be able to send probes, very small probes, to, to other stars. If you can get from, from as it were, one planet, one star to the next star, if you can do that, and then build a colony there, and then once you've built that colony up, that colony sends out new colonies from there. Human beings have occupied the entire planet because we have proceeded kind of like this, right? From out of Africa, we've taken over the entire planet in a geologically very short period of time. If uh, an advanced civilization can spread itself between the stars, it would do so on a time scale which in geological terms or astronomical terms is very, very fast. They could easily spread across the entire galaxy within, let's say, a few million years. In 1950, during a lunchtime discussion about how common life might be in the universe, Astronomer Enrico Fermi asked a simple question which has been dogging astrobiologists ever since. If our galaxy is teeming with intelligent life, and it would only take a civilization a few million years to spread throughout all the billions of stars, then where are they? Why don't we see them right here, right now, on our planet? The Fermi argument is that if any of these aggressively colonizing civilizations uh, had appeared in the history of the galaxy, they would have swept past the Earth long ago. And, and it could have happened thousands of times from different independent centers. They could have these colony, colonization wavefronts could have swept past our position thousands of times in the history of the galaxy, and all of them have left us alone. So then the question is, is this plausible? 
and you can't prove it's impossible, right? But the argument really is a plausibility one. If, if completely independently evolved aliens have been our way tens of thousands of times while planet Earth has been sitting here wide open to interference from outside, uh, occupied solely by microbial life forms for most of its history, none of these um, civilizations have stopped here and said, well, here's a planet, it's occupied by microbes, but um, we need this planet for our own purposes and they're only microbes, so we'll take it over. That has not happened, because had it happened, we wouldn't be here now. There's a whole group of explanations that they are, they are here. You know, they have come to, there's a small spacecraft hiding in the asteroid belt it looks just like an asteroid and it's having a look at us because it like because they like to see how civilizations evolve so they might be here and we might be unaware of them well yeah they might be invisible they, yeah, they might be in this room and be invisible um which uh we couldn't do but a billion year old civilization could do that we're stuck with very, very simple unicellular forms um, of life um, right up to uh, just before half a billion years ago. So you can imagine an alien civilization sort of monitoring what was going on uh, on the Earth as life was evolving. And after three billion years of not very much happening, you can imagine they may well have packed their bags and gone and monitored something else. The only real ways to explain the paradox that we see no evidence of this is, well, perhaps we're the first, so nobody else has done it yet. Um, perhaps it's actually just impossible to spread out between the stars. There's no physical reason to, to think that that's the case. Um, or, uh, or perhaps they're hiding, is the other one that, that, that frequently comes up, that they are out there, but we're not sufficiently advanced or friendly enough for them to want to make contact with us. Another simple explanation is, although um, people like us, us pop up from time to time, there is one advanced civilization which doesn't really like other civilizations. Every time a civilization starts to pop up, it zooms along and kills them. This, this is called the Berserker theory. That there's, there's one very nasty civilization out there which wants the whole galaxy to itself. So every time a life looks as though it's evolving towards Getting exploring the galaxy, it comes and blows the planet up, uh, and we're next in line. Another possibility is that before a civilization reaches a level at which you can explore the stars, it ends up getting replaced by its own technology. There is a solution to the Fermi paradox, and it's called the zoo hypothesis. And the answer is that every time an alien civilization comes our way, they see here is a planet inhabited by microorganisms, therefore we will not touch it, it will be unethical for us to touch it. We'll sit outside and we'll watch it for a bit, and then we'll go on our way. But a physical presence is not the only way to discover alien life. If you point a radio telescope in a certain direction, and if there's a signal coming back from it, which is not a normal radio signal, you know, like a quasar, but it looks artificial, then you know there must be somebody sending it. You can do the same thing looking for optical flashes. If you look for a very, very short flash, which nature can't make, and if you see these flashes, um, that must come from an artificial source. The problem is that finding this kind of signal is just too easy. There are two big searches going on at the moment, uh, both in California, and both of them, most days, they pick up a strange signal. In most sciences, you can fool yourself by finding something that's not there, and looking for the SETI, it's, it's terribly easy to fool yourself. There was a classic case in a, a radio telescope in Australia a few years back. They were doing radio astronomy, looking at these sources, and they got these occasional burst of radio signal, very short, very intense, and then somebody worked out it only happened during lunchtime. And what was happening, if you open the microwave before it's finished, a little burst of microwaves, it doesn't switch off at the instant the door is open, you get a little flash of microwaves. 
And this comes up, comes into the telescope. But to receive signals from other worlds, this requires there to be intelligent life. And intelligent life is the final step of the four-part mathematical equation. So if we're going to find intelligent life, we need the second step first, photosynthesis. For the first time, we can now say confidently that there are literally thousands of habitable planets in our galaxy. Most stars have planets and many, many of them are small rocky planets in the so-called Goldilocks zone where liquid water makes life a possibility. We are even starting to examine those planets' atmospheres for signs that life already exists. We don't know yet whether any intelligent life exists elsewhere, but if it does, but if it does, then it would have had plenty of time to explore our solar system, so there's a fairly high chance that it knows about us. But if there is life out there, and if it is complex and even intelligent, then it will have to obey the same evolutionary rules that life on Earth has had to cope with. And that means that if we look at our own planet's evolution carefully enough, we can be surprisingly confident about what alien creatures, if they are out there, would look like. Earth was colonized by single-celled microorganisms for, you know, for most of its, most of its history, it kind of tells us that, that that's kind of the, the happiest place for life to be in a way, you know, that something quite unusual has to happen to, to get multicellular life. It is true that um, they sat around for uh, a couple of billion years, not up to much, um, and not turning into more complex um, eukaryotic cells, multicellular animals. The thing about multicellular life is it's a lot more energy intensive than single cells. And certainly once you get up to large, really large multicellular life forms like animals, such as ourselves, then our energy requirements are ginormous which basically means the kind of energy sources that single-celled extremophiles or microorganisms typically use, geochemical, exploiting geochemical gradients, don't provide enough energy. What keeps the large animals going, like us, is combining oxygen in the air with uh, carbon-based compounds that we uh, eat for food. Things seem to have changed gear uh, quite radically just before an event called the Cambrian um, Explosion. So if we look through the fossil record up to uh, about uh, 575 million years or thereabouts, we've got uh, single-celled organisms, uh, things for example like um, stromatolites. These are um, mats of cyanobacteria that... Um, uh, stabilize the sediment and build up these pillows and these are photosynthetic um, uh, cyanobacteria and they were instrumental actually in changing the atmosphere in uh, putting oxygen into the atmosphere which hitherto um, hadn't been present. I think photosynthesis is, is necessary for diversity just because you need the diversity of animal life just because you need oxygen in the atmosphere. I think once you get multicellularity you then you know you then have a whole kind of new set of tools available to you to be able to adapt to different environments to be able to get the most out of an environment you know to actually develop a new strategy to get you know kind of the food that you need for example you know or to outcompete your nearest neighbor. Um, so I think once you have that ability you know then it's you know, sky's the limit basically you know it's just just evolution will just go forth and, and do its mad, wonderful thing. In essence then, before we can find animal life, we must first find plant life. But what are those plants going to look like? Plants on Earth are, are, have a form that's sort of optimised to gather light energy. And so they tend to have flattened surfaces, leaves, and they tend to evolve branching structures uh, which evolve again and again. So, for example, the tree-like habit has evolved many times. Uh, and you can model these sorts of processes fairly simply mathematically. It's likely that anywhere where advanced life has evolved, plants similar to ours are probably fairly common. So if plant life is similar to ours, does this mean that alien animal life will be too? Once life gets going on a planet, it, it, I think it becomes fairly predictable, particularly in its shapes and forms. 
one might consider that there are certain um, optimal solutions um, to particular problems and one could almost predict what some of those solutions might be and these have a number of adaptations that seem quite likely within um, animals generally and I, I would expect to find these if we were to find complex multicellular life elsewhere in the universe. If you look at life on Earth, they, they tend to have um, a front end and a back end, and it makes sense. You want to eat the food and get rid of the waste, uh, and move away from the waste you've produced. And I think any animal that ingests material, you would expect to have a front end. They tend to have a through gut. They have a mouth at one end and an anus at the other, and food passes through. You see this right the way through all body plans um, of, uh, of life on Earth, apart from radially symmetric life. So you get things like starfish, sea urchins, uh, and those sorts of things sit on the seabed and eat food from different directions. So simple worms and starfish shapes are quite likely in early life. So bilateral symmetry means that you can run out the same developmental program uh, based on the same genes on either side of the body. So your left and right side are effectively mirror images of one another. Um, because they are bilaterally symmetrical, because they have a left and a right side and a top and a bottom, they tend to have um, legs or cilia or indeed a muscular foot on the underside, so they've got this ventral surface. Um, they tend to have um, uh, the sense organs clustered at the front of the animal, so they need to travel in a particular direction, they need to see where they're going, they need to sense their environment and interact with it. Sense organs like tentacles or antennae, things of this description to tactile, have a tactile sense of where the animal is going. So you want to cluster your sense organ, organs at the front, um, and in other words, you want to evolve ahead. So you want to have, uh, probably have your, the concentration of nervous tissue at the front of the animal uh, to process this information so you have a brain at the front end. So whatever form life in the universe takes, Familiar structures like heads, faces, jointed legs are likely to appear everywhere. But there's more. Life is always likely to evolve first in water, and that sets down its own rules, which can affect the whole history of evolution. So that nice streamlined shape that many fishes adopt um, is one that one could predict by, uh, by doing sort of modelling from first principles. Uh, one of the questions you might ask is why don't fish have propellers? And you could imagine a fin on a fish rotating and then moving back to the back of the fish where it would drive the fish forward. But in fact, propellers are very inefficient. They, they cavitate, create air bubbles in the water. And so the most efficient way of getting through water is to slither your way. And you would expect to find similar things elsewhere on other planets. If you went to a, an extraterrestrial ocean, I think you would find living things, if there were there, um, slithering their way through the ocean and not using propellers. And similar rules define the shapes of any creature that flies. There are um, three groups of vertebrates that um, have evolved powered flapping flight. Um, the birds, the bats and the extinct group, the pterosaurs. And, uh, of course, the constraints of um, aerodynamics mean that uh, you want a wing that has the same sort of general properties. The way in which the, the wings of birds and bats and indeed pterosaurs are constructed uh, is rather different. So the, uh, the way in which, of course in a bird, um, uh, it's feathers which are supported in a bat, it's a membrane um, supported by the splayed out fingers and joining down onto the the hind limbs as well. Um, but the, the physics of the process is, is largely similar. Um, and again, the same with, with pterosaurs. Life on Earth is very much driven by the laws of physics. And those laws uh, will make things evolve in predictable ways. Uh, and as you look back through um, the history of life on Earth, certainly you see weird and wonderful forms, but they're not that diverse. You see life uh, conforming to rather narrow uh, shapes and structures. Um, there are some very, very striking examples where 
groups evolve along remarkably similar lines to produce very, very similar endpoints. So one of the best known examples, if you look at the mammals, there are two very large groups of mammals, the placental mammals, like ourselves, and the marsupial mammals, for example, kangaroos and koalas. Um, now, the placentals and marsupials really diversified and radiated separately. The um, marsupials, particularly in um, Australasia and South America, and the placentals largely elsewhere. But the fascinating thing is, both the placentals and the marsupials, from very, very, probably very small, rather rat-like beginnings, um, evolved to produce um, strikingly similar things like, for example, the thylacine wolf, which looks very, very much like a canid or a dog. Um, the honey glider, for example, looks very, very much like a flying squirrel. So all over the Earth, evolution starting from very different species has produced environments and creatures to fill them, which have ended up strikingly similar. However, there's a key limitation to this effect. Well, clearly there are limits to how far convergent evolution can um, produce similar forms. Um, one phenomenon that takes place is, as groups um, evolve, and particularly as their, the design of their body, their body plan becomes more complex, uh, is that you're building more and more um, systems on top of one another. And this can mean that it becomes more difficult to make a fundamental change. And it seems some things uh, get uh, kind of stuck. The fact that mammals have four legs is probably based on the fact that fish have four fins, or at least our ancestral fishes had four fins. Um, but, for example, you have insects you have six legs, you have uh, other arthropods with many other uh, numbers of legs. So there's maybe nothing preordained in the number of legs you have to have to live on land. So the same goes for um, the number of digits. So um, tetrapods, four-legged land-living vertebrates, all have five uh, digits. At least some of them have lost some of those, like horses, but basically we're stuck with five as the, as the basic ground plan. And that goes back to some of the first tetrapods that came onto land. And they initially experimented with um, seven, eight, nine uh, digits. And at some point, five was in inverted commas, settled upon, but that may simply be chance. One of the slightly sort of disturbing statistics is there are more species of parasite than there are of non-parasite. So again, we might well expect to find lots of parasitic organisms in, a, in an alien ecosystem as well. And of course we find there are many fewer predators than prey items as well. We might find to, uh, that sort of dynamic too. Given what we know of the alien physicality, what does this mean? for alien temperament. Certainly, if you are a predator, you need to, um, you need to anticipate the movements of your prey. Uh, you probably need to go uh, looking for your prey, or maybe you, you hide and ambush it. But you, you certainly need um, uh, the ability to um, uh, process um, sensory information uh, and do that quite quickly. And so certainly on Earth, we find that the, the predators tend to be the the, the, the more intelligent. I think if you found extraterrestrial intelligence, it would probably exhibit some sort of aggressive tendencies. That's how it got to a point of being a successful organism on the planet at which it evolved. You would also expect probably to see some sort of cooperation just because intelligence is likely to evolve in a social animal where it has um, social groupings because intelligence uh, really only makes sense when you're in a community of, of organisms that can use that intelligence uh, to, to leverage success in the environment. We, we just don't know whether intelligence is inevitable once you get multicellular life. It's only happened uh, at least once to the extent that we have intelligence as far as we know on the Earth. So is that always going to happen? It's not always clear that, that intelligence is an evolutionary benefit. The dinosaurs had mastery of land, sea and air for a about 165 million years, but as far as we know, they didn't involve the same uh, sort of intelligence that we have. Um, it's a real puzzle that we're able to turn our minds to questions like the origin of the universe, the fundamental nature of 
reality, quantum mechanics. These are problems which we, at some level, we, we, we can't really see that we are adapted to solve. That's not the selective pressure that was operating on us uh, when we appeared as a species. Um, some people have explained that in terms of uh, runaway sexual selection. The idea that um, females were selecting mates with um, uh, intelligence in much the same way as um, a peacock's tail. That's an enormous structure that the peacock has to produce. It's very costly. It's actually a bit of a, a lumber to it. Um, and by producing a very large tail, the, pe the peacock is saying, Look, I'm just generally so fit, um, I can afford to do this. Um, I'm generally of very high genetic quality, um, so mate with me. So with all this new information, what conclusions can we draw about both alien planets and alien life itself? We can be pretty sure that by far the most common life in the universe will be tiny single-celled creatures, but that these creatures can be massively diverse. We know that wherever bigger animals evolve, they're likely to do so in the water first. And that means creatures shaped like worms and fish are going to appear more or less everywhere. It makes sense to have your mouth at the front and your sense organs in pairs above it. So heads and faces should always spontaneously come about. From then on, if there are bigger animals, and especially land animals, it's hard to see how they could exist without lots of oxygen in the atmosphere, and that means plants. And those plants, however they evolve, are likely to end up looking a lot like the plants and trees of Earth. And those plants, however they evolve, are likely to end up looking a lot like the plants and trees of Earth. At this point, things get a little harder to predict. Somewhere early on in the simpler animals, one or two particular body plans will start to become dominant on each planet. Maybe aliens somewhere will have a dozen legs. Maybe somewhere else just four. Maybe on one planet they'll have a hard exoskeleton like insects or bones like ours. Maybe they'll be supported in some other way, but once this random choice is made and the body plan is laid down, the more complex life becomes, the harder it is to change. But that's not the end of our story. Because convergent evolution tells us that wherever there is life, it encounters the same problems and finds the same solutions. Animals with completely different evolutionary paths on Earth have ended up looking and behaving strikingly similarly. So it may well be that our search for what aliens might look like leads us right back to the one place in the universe we can already explore. Life on alien worlds will not be exactly as it is here, but we may have more in common with aliens than we think. And as for intelligence, that one attribute that allows humans to start to explore the universe and search for aliens, well, if we take our own planet as a model, the evolution of a brain like ours might only occur once in a galaxy of a hundred billion stars.